social security and overall income planning seminar or workshop and uh, of course we'll cover social security because that's the main topic well, most folks came out to to talk about but also are going to mention medicare federal employee health benefits federal pension tsp 401k ira we're going to cover pretty much everything we can within this uh, relatively short period of time or amount of time so a little bit of a disclosure as always we have to be compliant so this is going to be information which we'll make as um, specific as we can but given that this is a general conversation given that we don't know each of your specific situation we can't give individual uh, recommendations uh, so anything you hear today please just um, verify with a, a professional in the field okay uh, which could be us or could be somebody else <coughs> a little bit about us we're sovereign wealth management uh, we started of well, our company uh, began in uh, the 1980s with uh, one of the first certified financial planners in the area uh, Linda English and we're kind of carrying that torch still into the future so to speak uh, now that she's retired and um, I'm the principal of the firm we have Katya who does marketing Elena in the back who handles the operations and pretty much everything else and then we have Svetlana who is client services and David is our new financial planning associate he's so new he's not on the board yet a little bit about me we like the beach this is uh, me in Florida and my wife and our two kids they, he likes swimming and she likes uh, ice skating so <clears throat> so let's start with Social Security so how many folks here are already uh, well are within five years of, of starting to take Social Security okay and is anybody already actually taking Social Security okay well, great so a little bit um, for everyone here today okay so when can you file so let's start with the basics you can start at age 62 and of course some of this information many people will already know we want to make sure that we start with the basics and then get a little bit more specific so that we cover um, the most folks who are looking for information so if you want the full benefit your Full retirement age 66 67 depending on when you were born you get the hundred percent of the benefit if you want to wait until 70 you get 132 percent of the benefit the wage tax so how do how does the government collect the funds to pay you your Social Security benefit well so they tax your wages for your entire working life at about six and a half percent gets withheld that's the FICA tax so the top end of that wage that is taxed is in 23 it's 160,000 so they take six and a half percent of 160,000 of your of your wages and put that into the, the Social Security fund the trust there's a cost of living adjustment on average it's about 3.7 percent per year um, last 20 years it's been about two percent 22 it was in 2022 it was 5.9 and this year it's closer to nine percent 8.7 or so and that's probably going to be as big as it gets for a while so if you see here the difference between the minimum benefit um, the full benefit and the maximum quite drastic so if you're thirty three hundred forty five dollars is the full retirement benefit if you take the minimum it's twenty three hundred sixty four dollars the maximum is four thousand one hundred ninety four so one of the main uh, criteria that folks think about when they're looking to uh, decide on how they're going to take their Social Security benefits, of course, is how long am I going to live? Because if you're 62 and you think that you're going to live until 70 or 75, obviously you would just start at 62. If you think you're going to live until 90, well, then you start thinking maybe I should wait to take my Social Security, uh, to start my Social Security benefit and um, what often what mistake often is made is people look up the average um, life expectancy which is 76.8 years 
but 76.8 years is for somebody that is born today. So what you want to be looking at is the average life expectancy for somebody your age right now. And so this is the average life expectancy for somebody that is 65 years old. So 50% of men who are 65 year, year, uh, years old right now will live to 89. 50% of women will live to 90. 25% of men will live to 94. 25% of women will live to 96. 5% of men will live to age 100, 5% of women will live to age 102. The life expectancy of a 62 year old is 82 years right now. That's for males and for females it's 85. So that's one factor you have to think about. Marital status is also, well, health obviously is important because that could shorten or lengthen your life expectancy. So if you want to think about longevity, when we do financial planning for clients, um, you look at the genetics in your family. That's important. Um, if you've had some bad history, most folks are pretty healthy these days. So they usually you know, live this long or longer. So, well, half of them do, obviously. Um, so marital status is very important because depending on your situation, married, single, divorced, widow, um, you have a lot of different options that we'll cover today. Employment status. So if you're still working, even if you're working part time at Home Depot or something, cause you like to work at Home Depot. I had a client who, <laughs> um, she, so she had this really fancy job and then she retired and she just said I'm going to work at Home Depot because I spent all my free time there anyway so it's like volunteer the money she didn't need the money she just liked being there and they pay her to be there so but the reason employment status matters is because if you start your Social Security too early let's say between before full retirement age uh, if you make enough money they'll just if you make more than twenty one thousand two hundred forty dollars they'll just take that whole Social Security benefit, um, part of it, or potentially all of it, and then they just will wait until you get to full retirement age, and then we'll pay it out then. So we'll discuss that a little bit further. So here's one strategy that can be deployed. We'll discuss several strategies, and then you can just have them as options for yourselves to think about. Married couples split strategy 62-70. So if married, the younger lower earner may want to begin taking their Social Security benefit at uh, 62, at the earliest possible. So you see here we have Sam, whose full retirement age benefit amount is 2400 and Kathy is 700 because maybe she stayed home, raised the children while he worked full time. And so her benefit is less than she went to work when the kids grew up. And so her benefit would be 700 at full retirement age. So she chose to take her benefit at age 62. And it's a reduced rate uh, because she's taking it early. But it gives a little bit extra, a little bit of money uh, to hold them over until um, until the big benefits uh, begin later. At age 70, um, when Sam takes his benefit, now he gets this huge benefit, not $2,400, but $3,168, uh, because he waited, so he gets 132% of the benefit. And Kathy can add another $500 to her benefit, because she is now, because Sam now has taken his benefit as the primary earner, Kathy is entitled to the larger of either her benefit, 525, or half of Sam's full retirement benefit. Okay? So that's why she has this uh, benefit as well. And so now they have all this income combined going forward. But another key point to consider here when you're thinking about Social Security 
especially if there was somebody who stayed at home with the kids and maybe is relying on their spouse for, for most of the Social Security income, is if Sam passes away because um, Sam waited to take his benefit till age 70, when he passes away, Kathy gets his entire benefit. So she steps up to his full survivor benefit, or that's her survivor benefit. Uh, no, so that the five twenty five the the thousand twenty five dollars goes away. She just gets Sam's full benefit. So this is important because if he would have taken his benefit early as well, yes, they would have had more money earlier. But when he passes away, then she would have a much lower benefit left with. Married couples, so, so we get this question, should the lower earner wait until 70 or full retirement age? So should Kathy in that previous um, situation wait until 70 to take her benefit um, or, or her spousal benefit or should she take it earlier? So you can see this primary earner benefit, it continues to grow from age 62 to age 70. However, the spousal benefit stops growing at full retirement age. So there is really no reason to wait during this period. However, the caveat is the spousal benefit so the spouse, the lower earning spouse, is not eligible to take the spousal benefit until the higher earning spouse initiates their benefit. So if they're waiting until, getting, until the higher earner gets that 132% of the benefit, then the spousal benefit does have to be postponed even though it's not growing here. But in the meantime, like in Kathy's situation, that's why she, weighed, she was receiving her lower benefit through this whole period, because she started at 62, okay? But that's just, and the, the important point here is the spousal benefit stops growing at, at full retirement age for the spouse. Um, by the way, a few other little caveats here. Uh, to be classified as married, you have to be married for one year to be eligible for the spousal benefit and actually have to be currently married. So for divorcees, um, what is the strategy if you're divorced? So to be eligible for your ex-spouse's benefit, um, you have to still be single. So if you're remarried, you don't get the ex-spouse's benefit. Um, both you and the ex-spouse have to be 62. And the marriage must have lasted for at least 10 years. Uh, this actually happens, I know of people quite often that they will be married and they'll be married eight years, nine years, and then they'll get divorced. And they don't know that they will be forfeiting this, this potential benefit. So if you know somebody that's in that situation, just tell them to hold on for another year or, you know, what do they have to do just to get that, potentially get that benefit, you know, depending on how bad the situation is. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Yes, and the divorce must have been finalized at least two years ago. Now, the, the difference between the spousal benefit for married couples and the spousal benefit for divorced couples is the lower earning divorcee does not have to wait until the higher earner starts their benefit to receive hers. Because you can imagine that conversation, a uh, divorced couple, you know, the lower earning divorcee calls the previous husband and says, you know, I need you to start your social security because I'm kind of hard up for cash. Um, otherwise, I, I don't, I can't start up my, you know, uh, otherwise I, I'm not making the bills. So that's why the IRS said, well, or the government, the Social Security Administration said, well, we'll just make it independent. So for widowers, how does Social Security work for survivors? 
you get 70% of the benefit if you take it at age 60. So it starts earlier, it starts at age 60. 100% of the benefit at age 66 or past age 66. And if you're disabled, you can start at getting 100% of the benefit at age 50. So a strategy that can be used here is, you know, if there's a survivor, the benefit, so if the survivor benefit is less than your own benefit, then you can start receiving your survivor benefit at age 62, keep working and then switch to your own full benefit at full retirement age or at, at age 70. If your own benefit is higher than the survivor benefit, then the survivor can start getting the survivor benefit at age 70 and switch to their own at, or at age 60 and switch to their own at age 70. But you can't still work, right? And make over 20,000. Yes, well, that's a good point, and I'll show you that on another chart. You're right. So any of these benefits, you would be taxed if you work. Social security strategy for divorced survivors. So the previous was assuming that they're married, this is divorced. So for divorced survivors, they receive the higher of their own or the deceased spouse's benefit. If the deceased primary earner never filed or filed after their full retirement age, around 66 or 67, the divorced survivor's spousal survivor benefit will depend on their age when they take it. If the deceased primary earner filed before full retirement age, the divorce survivor will receive the higher of the amount of the primary earner was receiving or 82% of the full retirement age benefit. And then it's adjusted for the um, divorce survivor's age. It gets complicated, we could just run those numbers. They, they can be run if, if that's the situation, if you know somebody in that situation. Another, you know, this doesn't happen too often, but unfortunately more often than we'd like. So social security strategy for widowers of disabled deceased spouses. So if somebody was disabled and then they pass away, can the living spouse who's left receive the disability benefits of that, uh, of that deceased spouse who was disabled? So group one, if you're between age 60 and full retirement age, you can receive between 71.5 and 99% of the spouse's disability benefits who passed away. If you reach full retirement age, you can get 100% of those disability benefits. If you're between 50 and 59, you can get up to 71.5%, but you also have to have your own qualifying disability, so if you're disabled as well. And if you're caring for a child, you can also receive 75% of the spouse's disability benefit. So, We'll get this question. We'll start Social Security, um, and then a person will either go back to work or just continue working, maybe part-time or full-time. And the question is, well, I keep, I'm keep, I still work, and I'm paying into the Social Security system. Do I get an increase in my benefit? The bad answer is maybe, or the so-so answer is maybe. The better answer, yes, if the earnings during these new working years while you're taking Social Security exceed one of the 35 years adjusted for inflation that is used to calculate your Social Security benefit. So how is Social Security calculated? Um, it's calculated by taking your highest earning 35 years, and if you work less than 35 years, then those years are just zeroed out and used in the average. And then those years are adjusted for inflation and that's how the benefit is calculated. Now, if you work during, after age 62, after you're taking your benefit, those years are simply just added to that 35 and just displace the lower 35, the lower of the 35. So you may get an increase, but it's not going to be a huge increase. So bipartisan budget act of 2015. So reason I'm showing these different bills because they, they did change some of the Social Security rules. So, <clears throat> file and suspense strategy is gone, restricted application is gone, so these were ways to kind of double dip in the system. So those are no, no longer available to us. I bring up inflation because it's very important and you'll see why when we talk about Social Security and what, you, what strategy you choose. Because unfortunately, um, 
the reported inflation and going to the grocery store inflation doesn't quite seem to match um, exactly. So here's just some numbers. A loaf of bread in 2000 it was $1.26. In 22, it's gone up almost three times, $3.31. Pound of beef, $2.46 versus $4.43 in 22. So that's basically double. Um, milk has gone up about 50% from 278 to 377. Gasoline has more than doubled, almost tripled. But that jumps around quite a bit. So why is planning so important? So let's take a look at just three basic strategies. So you have Ron and Nancy. They're currently 60 and 58. Their full retirement benefit monthly is $3,011 for Ron and $2,235 per month for Nancy. Their life expectancy is 85 and 90, and they start their benefits at 62. Their cumulative lifetime benefits, if they live to their life expectancy, are 1,659,336. Same couple, if they start their benefits at age 67, or at full retirement age, they have a lifetime benefit of a million nine hundred forty-four thousand five hundred sixteen. So about three hundred thousand dollars more. If they wait until age seventy, the total amount is two million one hundred twenty-six thousand one hundred thirty-six. So from sixty-two to seventy, waiting, um, total difference of four hundred sixty-six thousand eight hundred dollars. So that looks like a large amount of money, and it is a large amount of money, uh, but it may not be as large as it seems when we get into some of the other data that, that you'll see. So break even, social security break even, at what point does waiting become a benefit for you versus not? So the break even is right around 77 years, 76 to 78 years here. That's the point where it doesn't matter which you took, 62, 66, or 70, which strategy you, you took to start your Social Security. Um, they, they break even. So here's another chart. Comparison of cumulative payments by age over 30 years. So at, by 72, of course, if you started at 62, you would have had 10 years of benefits. So that's the biggest pot. By 82, of course, payments started at age 70 went out and they keep winning until end of life. But here's, here's an important point that I, I'd like you to consider. You may have heard the, the Big Mac inflation estimate uh, that uh, people have talked about. It's kind of been in the press from time to time because it's, it's actually a very accurate inflation indicator over time. And what you see here and why do we care about the CPI, the inflation rate that's published, that's used by the government to adjust inflation rates, to adjust salaries, to adjust um, Social Security? So Social Security uses a variant of the CPI to adjust Social Security payouts, COLA. So you see here, if we use the CPI estimate, the official published inflation rate from the US government, then the price of a Big Mac should be $3.78. Since 1993, that's an increase of 66%. However, what has really happened? Reality. Price of $5.06, and this is slightly outdated already also, the increase is actually 122% since 1993. So what is the point of what I'm telling you here? The inflation COLA adjustment is really probably half, about half of what the real inflation rate is. I mean, I don't know, my wife shops, she says, well, everything's gone up about 33% in the last two years. And I do the shopping sometimes, and I notice the same thing. It used to cost $150, now it costs $200. If you go to Aldi, if you go to another store, it can cost $400. And so if your COLA 
So if your Social Security is going up and adjusting for inflation, but that inflation is actually lagging real inflation, then is it really $466,000 that you're getting by waiting until 70? Or is it much less than that? Right? Because you are waiting 10 years. So in, in these 10 years that you've been waiting, or let's say eight years, if you were to start at the 62 instead of seven, you would have had eight years of building up your reserves. You could say maybe you were investing those funds if you were disciplined. And then that money is there in a, in a bucket, so to speak. So when you do need extra funds, it's there. It's, it's growing for you, paying you dividends. That's just a thought. That's a factor to think about for you. So here is that another important point to consider if you are thinking about taking your Social Security before full retirement age. So if you're under full retirement age and your earnings from wages and net profit if you're self-employed is above $21,240, for every $2 over this limit, $1 is withheld from your benefit. So Social Security will withhold $1 for every $2 you earn over this limit. And in the year you return, in the year that uh, you reach full retirement age, the amount is $56,520, over which for every $3 of the limit, $1 is withheld from the benefit. Now, important, not counting towards the earnings limit are pensions, annuities, investment income, interest, veterans benefits, or other government or military benefits. So it's simply, it's just if you work. So the Social Security Administration is saying if you're working, then why are you collecting Social Security? Now, the funds are withheld, but they're not withheld forever. So once you reach full retirement age, these funds are taken that they withheld, and they're added to the bucket. So let's say you worked so much over this limit that instead of, that they basically, the Social Security Administration withheld like two years worth of benefits. So they simply take all that, whole, that entire amount of two years worth of benefits, and they say that you took, you started your benefits instead of as if at 62, but at 64. So they just add it, so they just subtract it from the time you started your benefits. So in a way it's fair, but you just have to be aware of this, that if your plan is to work and still receive your social security, it's not quite that simple. You have to think about um, that delay. And if you do think that you're going to drastically exceed this limit, you should let the social security administration know, because if you're counting on that income coming into your account, they'll just cut it off. The moment they see that, when they figure out that you're exceeding your earnings limit, they'll just cut off your income. It's not proportional adjustment, they just cut it off for like three months at the end of the year or something, whatever they think is appropriate. And then they'll start it back up next year. So again, some pros and some cons of taking your Social Security at 62. And again, we keep hammering this 62 because a lot of folks want to take this approach. So take it at 62, invest what is not spent to supplement income later. Get more control over your resources since the funds are in your pocket sooner. So you're investing those funds, whatever it is, treasuries, CDs, whatever you put it in, investments, dividend funds, um, or I guess if you're trying to just have a good time and buy a boat, I guess you could be doing that too. Uh, it's probably not gonna be that big of a boat, but it'll be a boat nevertheless. You could rent a boat. Um, so you have the chance of growing these funds and accumulating over a longer period of time. So eight years of benefits, it's a pretty big chunk of change. And uh, you've grown that to supplement your income later because your social security will be lower in the future, but you will have this extra pot of money to supplement your income. Another benefit which is hard to estimate but it's actually very, it's becoming more important as we go. Potentially avoid higher Medicare costs later due to IRMA tax on higher income. So you are probably aware that your Medicare premiums are dependent on your income. 
the higher the income, the higher the premium. So if you're waiting to take your Social Security until later and you're going to have this much higher benefit, well, with that higher benefit, you have a higher chance of getting into the next income bracket for the higher taxes. And federal, federal taxes, state taxes, as well as the Medicare taxes. So uh, we'll actually go over that. That's a great question. That's in, that's in the charts. Again, that big point, my favorite, is reduce the potential risk of the cost of living adjustments lagging real inflation. Of course, the cons are it requires discipline so as not to spend the extra funds meant for future spending now. So if, you're, if your strategy is, I'm going to take Social Security now, I'm going to save it for later, and I'm just... Uh, going to be smart and invest it, but then you actually don't invest it or part of it and you use it to have a good time, well, then you're going to be stuck with a lower benefit later and you won't have this money to supplement your, to adjust for inflation out of your own pocket. So social security buyback. This is something that's had a few questions about. You can buy back your social security benefit if you change your mind. So let's say you started your benefit at 62. And now all of a sudden, for some reason, you have a higher income because let's say you, you, know, you were working and you thought you were sick of your job, you didn't like your boss, and then you left your job, you started your benefits at 62, and then that boss left and the new boss came and you really like that person and you want to go back to work. And you go back to work and you say, well, now I don't need the social security. I, I want it to build up for later at 8% per year. Well, um, you can do that. If you're within 12 months of filing, you can actually give the money back to the government, no interest or anything. And then it'll be as if you never took the Social Security in the first place. This often happens with an inheritance. We actually had an attendee that had this happen. So uh, they, her, you know, a relative passed away and you know, she ended up with an inheritance and she wanted to just save the social security for later, go back to work. Or if the other big one that, again, I keep wanting to mention, um, if you did not realize, sometimes the higher earner doesn't realize that they are really hurting their spousal survivor benefit, almost that insurance policy for their spouse that maybe have a much lower benefit because they were at home raising the kids. Um, if the primary earner is taking their social security at 62, when they pass away, that spousal survivor benefit for, for the, the widow is going to be much, much less. So they may want to just go back, they change their mind when they figure this out, and then they pay it back, and then they just wait until 70 or until full retirement age. So again, with, this can be done within 12 months of filing, and you may have to do an amendment return if Social Security was taxed on a previous return. Social Security suspend. Um, so you can't suspend your benefits. Let's talk about some potential reasons to do this. High earner took benefit before full retirement age and now has reached full retirement age and would like to grow survivor benefit for spouse. So you can suspend your benefit at full retirement age. So let's say you started at 62 or 63. You cannot suspend it until you reach your full retirement age. But then you can suspend it and let it build for those few years that you're not taking it. Recipient took the benefit prior to full retirement age and now has higher income um, and would like to forego Social Security payments until age 70. So again, maybe they want to, they change their mind and they either want to save for that survivor benefit for the spouse they have, maybe they went back to work and they're doing some consulting. That happens a lot around, around here. And then uh, they'll just wait until 70 to get, to get the bigger benefit. And so here's how it's done. Example, let's say John's full retirement age benefit is $3,000. And again, these are very approximate numbers, just to give you an example. Uh, John started taking his Social Security at 62. He was receiving $2,250, which is the lower benefit at that, at that age, or 75% of the benefit. He suspended the benefit at full retirement age 66 and restarted at age 70, $2,000, well, this should be $2,250, times 
1.32 gets you back to almost $3,000 here. So, and these amounts would be adjusted for COLA as well. So this is just to give you the calculation of uh, the kind of the math and the, mind, the mindset of why you would do this. How many people uh, have worked for the federal government in here? Okay, quite a few. Well, all right. So we won't spend too much time on this because, you know, there's, there's a lot there, but we'll just go over it a little bit, the basics, and then if there's specific questions, we can certainly handle that privately. Uh, so federal employee retirement system pension for the unreduced benefits, 30 years of credible service, creditable service, and retire at minimum retirement age. 20 years of credible service and retire at age 60 or at age 50 under special retirement provisions. Um, you have to separate from the position uh, that is subject to FERS coverage and FERS annuity may supplement, a uh, FERS annuity supplement may be payable. Minimum five years of credible civilian service is required. Service requirement for reduced benefits is 10 years of credible service. Um, and there's a permanent reduction to the annuity. So off, this is the biggest question I get. So first, retirees, will I get Social Security and uh, my, for my federal pension? Yes, you get both. And the way the pension is calculated, um, your years of service times the annual average of the highest three, or the annual salary average, the highest three years of salary averaged out times 1.1. But you only get that 0.1% boost if you're, um, so you have to keep working until you're 62, basically. You can't postpone it. You can't leave early and postpone. A little bit of a, of a point. So sick leave, so you, you, I'm sure you know that if you, if you work for the federal government, that if you, don't, if you save up those sick days, you can get those days that the saved up, you can get those added to your, to your pension benefits, as if you work those days, um, or extra. So if you do have a bunch of sick days saved up, they are rounded up to the month. So let's say you have 70 days saved up, that's two months and 10 days. Those two months will be added towards your, social uh, towards your first pension calculation, but that 10 days will just fall off. So what I would suggest is getting sick right before, for 10 days right before you retire, I guess. And uh, that's what happens a lot. I'm just letting you know that that's what happens because those days will just go away. Um, if you want to receive your annual leave as lump sum, retire December 31st. Uh, so pension starts on the first of the month following retirement. So usually from what I've seen is best to retire at the end of the month because if you retire, let's say June 2nd, you're not going to be paid for that. So you're going to not have a salary that full month and then your benefit will start July 1st. Uh, whereas if you retire June 30th, your benefit, your pension will still start July 1st. So just best to work till the end of the month. So at least six months ahead of the retirement, make sure your career documentation is up to date because sometimes that will get messed up and you don't want to think that you're retiring in a month and then you end up having to work six more months because there was a miscalculation. Let's get a little bit into Medicare. Oh, sure. It does not count, your pension does not count towards this limit here. It does not count towards this limit. Because only wages count, not pensions. Right, but then there is a windfall provision that says that if you're drawing a pension, then your social security is going to be reduced by some amount. Well, you're talking about taxability. So taxes, that's different, right. So you do get taxed. Well, we're talking about the windfall elimination. Yeah, we're talking about the windfall elimination. Oh, okay, so I'm not covering windfall elimination here, but we can certainly, we can cover that. We can confirm that and cover that with you privately if you'd like afterwards. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, that's what I thought you were going to talk about when you draw both. You're not going to get the first No, yeah, this is just basics. Yeah, this is, uh, so that's why I kind of keep it to one page because there's so much there that it, it can get pretty crazy. Uh, but I'm glad to cover that with you. We could do a full page readout and everything, or printout and everything. 
So if we go into the Medicare, so for people 65 and older and those with disabilities, of course you have to be citizen, a legal resident, paid into Medicare for 10 years and have lived in the US five years in a row before enrolling. Your initial enrollment period, which is when most people enroll, is seven months around your birthday, three and a half months before and three and a half months after. The general enrollment period, that's if you missed for some reason your initial enrollment, is the first quarter of every year with benefits starting in the third quarter of that year. There's a 10% lifelong penalty for every year you are late to enroll. So that's why you will want to enroll um, and not be late unless you have other coverage that qualifies. So the different types of Medicare, of course, you have the Part A, hospital insurance, no cost unless you're receiving Part A services. So it doesn't cost you anything out of your check. It's, it's already paid for. Um, and it's if you if your, or your spouse worked for at least 10 years. So it covers rooms, meals, nursing services, equipment, operating room. Part B is the one that, the big one that everybody talks about because it's, it's the medical insurance. It covers everything else. So you have the substantial cost during retirement. You have the premium, you have the deductibles and the copay or the 20% coinsurance. So you have covering doctor visits, services, outpatient care, clinic visits, emergency room, ambulance, preventative care, medical insurance. Part C, Medicare Advantage. That's private insurance that replaces your Medicare, basically. So may or may not have a premium. It covers everything. Medicare A and B covers and more. Has an out-of-pocket limit. It's, it's almost like an HMO. So uh, what I hear about Medicare Advantage is, I can say I've never really heard anything really, really negative about it, but I haven't heard anything positive from folks. You know, they, they th the problem is if you go somewhere, there's often a problem with coverage because you have to be in a certain network that is more restrictive than other types of policies. And so, um, go ahead. Sure. No, a lot of times, and we'll cover that too, what happens is uh, you could, because you're covered by a group health plan, you're fine because you're not, you're covered by a plan that qualifies so that you don't, you're not, you're not penalized by Medicare. Most likely, that's the case. And, and when you say enroll, you, you mean enroll in either A, B, C, A? I mean, we enroll in A, obviously. It right, because it costs nothing. So, so it would be in B, right. Right, because when you retire, you would do it when you retire. So during that initial enrollment period. Can I just mention something about me? Sure. Since you brought it up. Um, she's not guaranteed that she will, she would have to go through underwriting is the problem. If she had become sick under C and decided to then go to Part B, she would be, have to go through underwriting and they have to pay a larger fee. And that was one of the negative. Okay, there you go. So that's, you know, I've heard a lot of reasons why people choose Medigap instead. Um, and that's what most people seem to do. And uh, I don't know, but the, some people still do Medicare Advantage. So it sounds like you have used. I've researched it abundantly and I also work for a law firm. So I know there are problems with C that people don't realize that haven't done the research and then it's too late. I see. Okay. Well, there you go. Yeah. I see. So they're trying to get you in. Okay. Well, thank you for mentioning that. So we have the Part D prescription drug coverage. Covers all types of classes of drugs normally used by Medicare participants. You know, premium and copay. You have tiers for drugs, and you have the Medicare supplement plans. The Medigap plans, I guess, help pay some out-of-pocket out costs, <coughs> letters A through N. Same coverage for the same letter, but they may differ in, in what they charge. So most Medicare participants choose Part A, B, and Medigap, as well as D. So that's the usual plan. So you get A, B, 
and Medigap. And again, enrolling, we already talked about when to enroll in Medicare. So here are the, well, this is 2021. So this is kind of the approximate numbers of the um, amounts you pay. Most people are in this area right here. If you file a joint return and you make less than $194,000 in income, that's your premium per person. But what happens over time is this number seems like a lot, but in 10 or 15, 20 years, that won't be that much. And these numbers will go up, and this number will stay, won't go up as much, and you'll just creep closer and closer to the higher, the higher premiums. It's what seems to happen over time. How often does that amount get uh, modified? That doesn't get a CBI or any other? They adjust. It gets adjusted, not yearly, but it gets adjusted. I'm, I don't think there's a specific yearly adjustment. So the federal employee health benefit. So this is a great plan that a lot of our clients hold on to even in retirement. And if you're a federal employee, then you may be the same, probably are. So you get 70, pay 72%, the government pays 72% of the benefit in retirement. Uh, to be eligible, you have to be eligible for immediate retirement, eligible for pension basically, and have to have been covered by the federal employee health care benefit plan for five years, for the last five years of employment. So they want you to paying into the plan before you retire. So there's four main options. So if you want lower premiums, but higher out of pocket, enroll in Medicare Part A only. And uh, so inpatient bills, Medicare will take care of, and then your federal benefit will cover afterwards. The outpatient bills, only your federal plan will cover. Option two, Higher premiums, less out of pocket. This is what most people pick. I see you enroll in Medicare, A and B, and you keep your federal employer employee health benefit. Then your Medicare pays first, and then your federal plan pays second. You really are pretty, really well covered there. Option three, you can never go back to your federal employer health plan, employee health plan, if you pick this option where you enroll in Medicare Part A and B with the Medicare Supplemental Plan, F, G, or N usually, that's what people do. And Medicare pays all the bills first, the Supplemental Plan pays second. Option four, you can suspend your federal employer health benefit with the option to go back to it. So this is if you enroll in Medicare Part A and B with Medicare Advantage Plan, Medicare C. And um, so insured pays co-pays, advantage plan pays the balance. So let's talk about inflation, retirement, taxes, Roth conversion. We're getting into more kind of retirement planning. Before you move out of sure. Medicare, um, it seems that option two, you're paying both premiums, Medicare B and I think it's B. Yes, you are. And because compared to the kind of, I mean, I guess it depends on your health or it depends on how conservative you are. It's really about, do you prefer to pay for your healthcare monthly or do you prefer to take the risk and maybe invest the difference or just save more money in your bank account just in case you have a higher healthcare expense later? So a lot of people who are really happy with their federal plan and like the fact that it's covered almost entirely by the government, are willing to pay those extra few hundred dollars to get coverage from Medicare and from that from the plan, almost double coverage. So that uh, you know, it, it, it's a very conservative option. You don't have to do it. You can run a side by side analysis and think about it. Well, the thing we've discovered in our research is uh, Medicare planning to go overseas for extended periods. Right. Medicare doesn't. Right. That's uh, yeah. That's an issue, right? So that's where the Medigap plans, I, I hear. As, like, yeah, like, really? Anyway. I've had um, the ARP folks seem to uh, do a pretty good job for some of our clients. They have those conversations. But maybe, maybe you're right. Um, we'll have to see. Thank you for, for mentioning that. I'll have to look into that. 
Um, so if we look at taxes and inflation, the government has to pay this somehow. And they're not going to default on this debt because that would mean basically end of the financial world as we know it. So it's easier to just print the money and pay it because you have the benefits to pay, you have everybody's salaries to pay, you have Social Security to pay, and you know, it's, the debts keep growing. So people have to get reelected. So how do you do this? You kind of creep it in. You stealth tax it through inflation. So of course, qualified accounts, your 401ks, your TSPs, your 403bs, your IRAs, again, that's, you could say that's each individual's responsibility. So the government doesn't handle that part. Secured Act of 2020 increased their starting age for required minimum distributions to 72, eliminated the stretch IRA where a non-spouse, if, so if you're a beneficiary of an IRA and you're not a spouse, you could have stretched out those distributions over your lifetime. Now it's a much shorter period of time. Um, and there's no limit, but there is no limit on uh, contribution age limit on IRA accounts anymore. And um, you now have the ability to buy annuities in your employer qualified employer plan. So if we look at Secured Act 2.0, which just passed, there's a lot of data on here, but I think some of it's, it's very useful, so I'll just go over it uh, fairly quickly, and you know we can get you the slides later if you're interested in seeing some of this data. So starting this year, the required minimum distribution age actually increases to 73. So if you turn 72 in 2023, you can postpone the RMD until 2024. And there will be higher catch-up contributions going forward starting 2025. So if you really want to put more into your retirement plans going forward, you'll be able to do so. Um, starting 24, also the contribution limits for IRAs will be adjusted for inflation, indexed for inflation going forward. Roth accounts and employer retirement plans are exempt from RMDs at this point. So a lot of times 401ks had RMDs before, whereas a Roth did not have RMDs. So Roth, a 401k Roth will not have an RMD anymore. The most interesting I find for, for folks to hear about are these provisions where student loan debt starting 2024, employers will be able to match employee student loan payments with matching payments to a retirement account. So it gives an extra incentive for, for uh, people to pay off their student loans. And 529 plans, so you may have kids or grandkids, uh, or grandkids probably, that you're contributing to uh, their 529s, or you have maybe friends or relatives, and um, some people say, well, there's already a bunch of money in these accounts, and my, you know, obviously our kids are really smart, so they're going to get all the grants and scholarships, and there's just going to be all this extra money in this 529. Well, there's a new provision now where after 15 years of the plan's life, uh, the assets of the 529 can be rolled into a Roth IRA. And the aggregate lifetime limit of this rollover is 35000 So it's something nice that you can really help, plan, uh, help a child plan towards retirement if they're a really hard worker and they've got a bunch of grants and they don't need all the money in the 529. That's rolled into the child beneficiary. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, not not back into. Yeah, that's a good point. Not back to the person who, um, who contributed the funds. Or if you're skipping a generation, not instead of five twenty nine to your grandchildren. Right, it goes to them. It goes to their. That's correct. That is exactly right. That's a great point. Uh, let's see here. Um, first two items. No, well, I mean, uh, let me just read what you're saying here. No, no, that's that's permanent. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah, it's this is all permanent, both of these. So again, a busy chart, but the contribution limits for your employer-sponsored plan: twenty-two thousand five hundred dollars in 2023. Um, Catch-up contributions, if you're over 50, are $7,500. Overall contribution limits to your employer and employee, 
contribution limits to your defined benefit plans or defined contribution plans are $66,000. So you can, there's a lot of opportunity to put money away if you want to. TSPs, so if you're a thrift savings plans, if you're a federal employee, again, contribution limit of $22,250 with a catch up of $7,500. Um, benefits, low expenses. Everybody knows low expenses, fairly simple choices. Uh, I mean, the negatives are, of course, if you're ever called in to do something and change your withdrawal options and so forth, it's not a pleasant experience. People are, are nice, it's just, it's not really set up for convenience. Uh, very limited investment options. Uh, I guess it's designed that way on purpose, but if you're trying to, if you think there's some good opportunities in certain areas of the investment world, you're not really able to take advantage of those in a, in a TSP. Now, there is a mutual fund window now where 25% of the value of the account can uh, go into a mutual fund account, but that's, again, 25% of the value, and there is a maximum on that, around 40000 or so. <coughs> Roth conversions. So you may have heard about Roth conversions and why do a Roth conversion, because... If you're putting money into a traditional IRA, you're not paying taxes until you take the money out of an IRA and the money is growing tax free. So why would you pay the taxes now so you convert a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA and pay all those taxes and all that income when you avoided paying all those taxes all this time? Well, the reason you may do something like this is if you think taxes are going to go up in the future and you and or Let's say you were working for a long time and then you and your spouse retired. All of a sudden you have a year where your income is much lower and then you haven't started your social security yet. So you have a year where your taxes are much, much lower than they will be in the future. So you can take advantage of that period by converting some of your traditional IRA money into a Roth, pay taxes at that lower income um, tax rate and um, that will allow you to save on future taxes because that will also lower your required minimum distributions in the future, which means it will lower your taxable income in the future as well because you will now have less money in those IRA accounts that are taxable. Go ahead. Is that basically just used income in your tax filing? Yes, it's just as, as earned income, just like earned income. Right, but, but you will never be taxed on that Roth money. Go ahead. Yes, of course. I mean, that's what a good financial planner specializes in. I mean, you could probably do it yourself, too. There's just there's a lot of there's software that does it. So you, you have to be looking at your... Well, so if you really are being extremely accurate about it, you also have to think about what future growth rates are in the investments, what potential tax rates are in the future, uh, what, um, what your potential income is in the future, all these. So the way most people do this when they do this calculation is if taxes are held constant, if, because tax rates are, are you know, they stay around the same amount all the time in general. Um, and, um, you have a pretty good idea usually at this at this point of what your income is going to be and then so you look at tax brackets and you want to stay under the realistic next tax bracket but you know you kind of run that in your you put all that together in an algorithm which is what we do for clients or what any other good financial planner should be able to do right great questions by the way thank you so <clears throat> Here's a strategy, how to retire early prior to age 59 and a half and withdraw from your retirement account without paying that 10% penalty because most folks are aware that if you take from an IRA before age 59 and a half, you're not only taxed at your current income tax rate, but you are also going to be taxed another, to penalize another 10%. So this is the strategy which is called substantially equal periodic payments. And here's an example. So you have John, that's 40, he's 45. He has 500,000 in his retirement account. He wants to start this strategy. 
There are several methods he can use. Annuitization method, amortization method, and minimum distribution method to do the calculation, which means every year he can take up to $25,000 from his account for the next 14 and a half years until he gets to 59 and a half. At which point he can um, start withdrawing because he's already e reached that legal age. He can start withdrawing without having the penalty. And this is important for people who maybe had a windfall, an inheritance, or just re are retiring early because they maybe did it real well in business or something like that, um, or married well, who knows. Uh, so uh, that's, um, that's an interesting strategy which gives you a lot of flexibility. Life insurance, just a tiny bit on this. There are strategies with life insurance that allow you to really save a lot on taxes, 100% principal protection, you're locking in your gains and you're able to take money from them. Plus, you can, there are ways to make long, life insurance pay your long-term care benefits as well. So it's, it's becoming a more crucial tool in financial planning. So we kind of keep mentioning inflation because it's a pretty big deal. But let's talk about the markets a little bit and how market volatility, because we are getting into a bit of a chaos here with the, with the market sometimes. Um, what, uh, what happens and, and how inflation and the market volatility affect your, your savings, your nest egg, so to speak, because I'm you know, most folks, when we have our seminars, have a pretty good nest egg saved up and they're worried about making sure that that money stays protected. So what impact can inflation have on your income? So how frequently do you need to double your income to maintain a standard of living? So at 6% inflation, and again, last year officially it was you know, 9%, your income needs to double every 12 years just to stay equal. Uh, at 4% inflation every 18 years, at 3% 24 years, and at 2% inflation 36 years. So to get back to even, if you lose 20% of your portfolio at an 8% return, it'll take three years. And again, that's not counting inflation. If you lose 10%, it's 1.4 years. But then if your return is 3%, because a lot of times when folks lose money, they become more conservative. So they're making 3%, 6% if they're lucky. Well, then you're, it's going to take you almost two years to get back to 10%. If you lose 30%, well, going to take much longer. Six years, possibly, if you're making 6%. New math for retirees. If you start with 100,000 and you lose 20%, you need 25% to get 25% uh, gains to get back to 100,000. If you lose 30%, you need to make 43% just to get back to the 100,000. So, you know, you lose 50%, well, you need to make an, you need to double. I mean, it seems obvious, but it's, not intuitive, actually, a lot of times. So the death zone. So this is your mountain of happiness in retirement. And if you fall off this mountain of happiness into the death zone, which is about a 20% loss, usually your investment portfolio, your nest egg, that's your mountain. You don't want to get down here or down here because that's where trouble kind of begins because that's where it starts affecting. It's hard to get back up here if you go below this, this level. $500,000, you make 50% because you have a great uh, investment that you've made yourself or with an advisor, and then now you're at $750,000, then you lose 50%. You're at $375,000. You make another 30%. You end up with $487,500. If you look at a, any perfectly honest, mathematically pure, portfolio performance statement that an investment manager will show you. Look, I made you 10% per year. I mean, that's a great return, right? But you're going to say, well, why, why do I have less money than I started with? Well, I mean, that's math, you know, just that's how it works. So there are other factors than just looking at the returns because math is, <laughs> math can be interesting when it comes to portfolio returns. A little bit about professional risk management. So we you know, often have clients who just 
I want you to just put it in some funds and just let's, let's just watch it, but don't ever move things around. Uh, and I don't want to talk to you ever. Just don't ever call me. I just want you to pay you this fee and just don't ever call us again. And that's fine uh, because there are clients who just believe in, um, you know, you set it and you forget it. And that's fine. And that's, that's okay because it works over the very long term. Um, however, a little bit of another strategy. So we're, for most of our clients, who prefer more active approach. So if we see something happening in the markets, uh, they like us to be proactive. So our strategy, so for instance, this is COVID, this big dip here, 37% loss in the S&P 500. Um, there were some signs here that things were not going well. So I'm going to start reducing risk. But it's not really about our own approach here. This is more about what was happening in the market. So you see these lines are just simply almost parallel lines drawn around the market trend. So after you had the big drop during COVID, the world governments, including the US, really flooded the market with liquidity. And that's what caused this big steady gain. And if you draw some lines around it, that just shows you what the trend is. So one of the most basic factors that we look at when we look at portfolio allocation, this trend builds, so this, this is a pattern. And if you see the moment a pattern like this that lasts several years breaks, that's when you really start thinking about, well, something is wrong. We need to start thinking about maybe pulling back from, uh, from our aggressive allocation, which we were in during most of this time. And again, index people or folks that just want to stay invested passively, that's fine. They, they will just stay and kind of weather this through. But if you're two years away from retirement or already in retirement, that can really hurt. So this is just one of very many factors that you look at. A simple technical analysis here, trend analysis, can help you figure out when to start cutting back risk. Nothing major, just you know, cut back into cash or into short-term treasuries or something that is not going to risk your, a lot of your livelihood. Now, it's not just technical indicators you look at. And here, of course, you would look at also macro indicators, like liquidity is being pulled back or rates are being raised. Well, everybody's so happy that the market's going up. Nobody's listening to the fact that the Fed is saying, well, we're really afraid of this inflation. We need to raise rates. We need to pull all this cash out of the market. We need to kind of pour all this punch out of the bowl and, and stop this party and everybody go home. But nobody's listening to that because everybody's real happy with their Bitcoin up here. And so it's hard to do it, but you, that's why you have to watch factors like, again, technicals. You have to look at macro indicators. You have to look at the real health of the economy underneath. Sequence of returns. This is quite important. This is S&P 500, 2000 through 2020. Returns, very small, it's hard to see. But you can see here that in 2000, you started with a million. You had a, a loss in the S&P 500 of 13%. In 2002, you had a loss of 33%. This whole time, you were withdrawing $50,000 annually. After 20 years, you would have ended up with $304,000. Average return of 6.91%. The same 20 years backwards, starting with 2020, ending with 2001. Same sequence of returns, just backwards. Average return, 6.91%. You ended up, instead of with 305,000, with $1.919 million. Because that's how important sequence of returns is. Here, these two big losing years are at the end. Here, they're at the beginning. So you're losing, you could say 50% on a much larger amount, which is not as, doesn't feel as significant. You still have plenty of money left over. So again, it's important to kind of smooth things out, so to speak. History of bear markets, average 31.9%. Uh, this last year, January through October is 25% loss. We've, our view is we're still not done with it. It's kind of more of a respite at this point. But we'll you have to watch it fairly closely. Um, one more point, and again, this is not a sales pitch for annuities or anything. Uh, I don't want you guys to think that this is, um, we handle all different types of strategies. We just want to show you this so you're aware of what's out there that you can do through yourself or through whoever you want to choose. Um, and so 
Why am I mentioning annuities? Because often folks want to have returns similar to the market, but they don't want any of the downside. Well, and there's big fees. So big fees that annuities are famous for are from usually the 1980s, 90s, where a lot of agents would push them because they get big commissions. And so now there are annuities which are more insurance based. They're not based, they're not, they don't move down. So they're guaranteed by the insurance company to not go down. They don't really have any fees unless you take income that's guaranteed for life, in which case there may be like a 1% fee or something. Um, so this is a particular client of ours. This is actually, I've erased her name, but this is an example of where you can get pretty good returns um, in the up years while at the same time losing nothing in the down years and in the end you end up ahead. Not over the very long term. I would say if you're invested 100% in the market over decades, you're going to beat an annuity. But, not, but over short to medium term, not necessarily. So uh, this client, so she used to have a, she had a TSP and she wanted more interesting returns, but she didn't want any downside. So we looked at a strategy for part of her funds. So we put in $724,000 in 2019. So next year we had COVID hit. And the market went down, as you know, like almost 40%. She didn't lose anything. And she made that year $118,000. So that's a 16% return. Because when the market went down, then it went back up. And annuities like this, they usually credit you once a year. And this index is tied to the S&P 500. The market actually went up more during that period. So if you would have stayed in the market, you would have made more, but she didn't lose anything. So what happened was then there was a down year in the market and she was just, she didn't make anything because the index went down, but she just got zero because the annuity doesn't allow losses. And so, when there is another very healthy year in the market, she probably won't make, if the S&P goes up 20%, she'll probably make 10 or eight. But the year before that the market was down, she didn't lose anything. So she's ahead again. So it's the tortoise and the hare, the tortoise is, is winning at this point. So this is just an approach that's an option for you out there as part of your planning. If you want returns tied to the market, you don't, don't want big fees, um, go ahead. What's your question? I had a question. She's not, she could. Now this is a fixed index annuity with no income rider, meaning there is no income guarantee in this annuity, there's just a principal guarantee. So this is for accumulation for people who are risk averse. They want gains, so there's no fees, it's just for gains. And then they could take up to 10% per year, one layer is a surrender charge. They could take up to 10% per year out. After that, they could take the whole thing. Um, Well, no, after seven years, she can take the whole thing. I mean, there's five-year contracts, there's three-year contracts, but the longer, the longer you, the contract is for, where there's a surrender charge for longer, the, the better the index returns. Because the insurance company knows that there's a higher chance that they will keep your money for longer so they could pay you more. So it benefits both. Uh, but of course, there are annuities. She could take money from this. She would just have gains on what she didn't take. So if she took out 5%, she would have this credited on the 95% she didn't take out. What kind of annuity was that? So this particular one is a Pacific Life. It's, um, it's, a fixed it's a fixed indexed annuity, so it's fixed. Yeah, so the variable annuities are the ones that give the, that are famous for the big commissions. There's like 3% fees in there. So because the mutual fund in there has the fee, then the, advice, then the, the agent has a fee, then there's a maintenance fee, so usually around 3% for those. It doesn't mean they're bad. They do work for some folks that really want more aggressive returns, and they do have an income guarantee usually on them. So I'm not saying all annuities are bad, but I just, I know that there's a bad connotation to annuities, and I think sometimes they're unfairly judged because it's not always bad. It's, and they've gotten a lot better than they used to be. And there's even ways to get annuities completely without any commissions or without any commitment. It's just a guaranteed rider on an investment account.
So there's all these new different ways, but I didn't want to get into that today because that's not really the main topic. I'm glad to answer any questions about that for you later. So, you know, just coming to the end here, you know, longevity, defined benefit plans, of course, we have health care, inflation again, um, all these issues, don't want to end on a negative, but these are all the concerns we have to think about when we do planning. And uh, if you would like your own social security strategy report, we can run one for you free of charge. Uh, when you're looking for an advisor, make sure you, if you are not somebody that kind of does it all themselves, um, make sure you find somebody that abides by the fiduciary standard and knows what they're doing and uh, looks at your situation separately from others. So they're not trying to go lead with the product, they're trying to understand what you actually are looking for and what your particular situation is. So that's it. Um, if there's any questions, you know, we can come up and I'm glad to answer them. Thank you, thank you.